Hello friends and welcome back to Generation Pixel Land. If you're new to the channel, well, thanks for dropping in and you've dropped in just in time for the A to ZX of the Spectrum. That's a small series where I take this boy here, the ZX Spectrum, and I'll show you some games from that particular era. And this week, well, we're on to episode 19, so that's the letter S. So if you want to see what games the letter S brings up for us on the ZX Spectrum, well, you just wait until after these titles. Okay, so first up for the letter S, we're going to talk about the Sacred Armour of Interiad. Now this is a game that could have been and should have been much more important in the video game world than it actually was. Now I would imagine a lot of people watching this video haven't even seen this game, never mind played it. But what you had with the Sacred Armour of Interiad, or let's just call it Interiad for the moment because that makes it so much easier, was a platforming maze exploration game in which you had to make discoveries to be able to progress and backtrack and open up whole new areas of the map. Now despite the fact that you've never played this game before, that short description probably rang a few bells for you. And if I start throwing in words like Metroid and Vania, well I'm sure you're starting to put two and two together. And when you think back to the beginning of this video and you realise that this game was released in 1986, it all starts to come together doesn't it? Castlevania and Metroid weren't the only two games of this particular new genre that were released in that very same year. In fact, Interiad was released slap bang in the middle of both of them. So what we're looking at here is a lost Metroidvania game, and it was a game that I sank so many hours into back in the day because it was just simply captivating. Now on the ZX Spectrum it wasn't quite as powerful as its Nintendo counterparts, but just look at what the developers managed to achieve in this game. The large, well-defined sprites, interesting enemy types, frustratingly hard levels to navigate, vivid colours, and combat of course that you had to develop over the course of the game. One of the most special features about this game though, it was released with a comic. You see See, the sacred armour of Interiad is set deep into our future, where aliens have taken over the earth and mankind has reverted back to an almost stone age existence. But when they discover the ancient texts that show them the location and the power of the sacred armour of Interiad, or that you'll be able to make out from reading the comic yourself, an anti-radiation suit. Much like the power armour in Fallout, but way before that, you then become humanity's last hope to take back the planet. You can truly be left with nothing but admiration for the team that put this together. And as I said at the beginning, it's just a shame that it didn't make it into the mainstream because this game could have been the third Metroidvania. But of course, Antiri Metroidvania is quite a mouthful, so we'll just leave it at Metroidvania for the time being. So would I recommend anyone playing the Sacred Armour of Interiad? Well absolutely, this game is fantastic. The gameplay is solid, the level design is fantastic, and it truly is one of those games that has managed to stand the test of time. So definitely, if you have the opportunity to play this game, get out there and play it. That is the Sacred Armour of Interiad from Palace Software in 1986. Second up for the letter S, let's look at an absolute classic, Sir Lancelot from Melbourne House in 1984. Now back in the early days of the ZX Spectrum and the other home microcomputers, these light puzzle platformer games were the bread and butter of the systems. And just because this is an early game from 1984, well it doesn't make it an easy game. Now don't get me wrong, they tended to be a tad bit easier than the arcade ports. Well they were all super hard because they were arcade ports. Games that were intentionally designed to chew coin after coin because that was simply the nature of their business. Some developers however quickly caught on that they didn't need to follow the arcade blueprint and could simply just make the games tough for that extra bit of longevity when it came to the gameplay. Now for 1984 Sir Lancelot was a good looking game. Don't get me wrong, it's no Demon Souls running on a Playstation 5, it's not got the looks of any of the Dark Souls games. But on that note, take a look at the aesthetics and the gameplay, because what is the true essence of any Souls like? It's a simple case of memorising patterns until you can defeat a boss and move on to the next level. 
level, and all wrapped up in a deliciously medieval setting. And when you look at Sir Lancelot, you can see it follows the same sort of design. Now you're not actually killing the bosses in Sir Lancelot, but what you're having to do is memorise the patterns and get your timing right to move on to that next level, and you will die, you will die a lot, just like in Dark Souls. So what I'm basically saying is the next time you catch yourself about to say a Souls-like, stop yourself and say a Sir Lancelot-like. Well, maybe not, but you know what I mean. So would I recommend anyone playing Sir Lancelot today? Well yes, absolutely, this is a fun little time killer. The graphics are absolutely stunning for the time and the gameplay again is solid. So get out there if you can and find yourself a way to play Sir Lancelot from Melbourne House from 1984. For game number 3 in the letter S, we're going to look at Super Wonder Boy in Monsterland, that wonderful game from Sega and published by Activision on the ZX Spectrum in 1987. And this is just another example of the little microcomputer that tried too hard, because no matter which way you're trying to cut it, Super Wonder Boy just doesn't run well on the ZX Spectrum. Now is the game itself far too complex for the machine then? Probably no, but what's happened with some of the game design? Well it just doesn't help the Spectrum at all. Now as anyone with experience of the ZX Spectrum knows colour clash was a terrible thing. It was something that developers struggled with for the longest of times and very few of them managed to handle the issue too well. So obviously to get around the bad colour clash in the Spectrum, most developers opted for a monochromatic scheme when they were putting together the designs of their games. And yes, Super Wonder Boy does the same thing, only ever two colours on the screen at the same time. And for me what seemed to be one of the biggest drawbacks was, well, when it came to monochromatic games it was best to have a simple dark dark background and light characters in the forefront. For some reason, when they developed Super Wonder Boy, they decided to go for fairly complex backgrounds. And yes, I can understand what they were trying to do. They were trying to make the game visually appealing, but the problem with a monochromatic scheme and an overly complicated background, yes, you lose the colour clash, but the sprites become so camouflaged into the background that sometimes it's just too hard to see them and I honestly can't imagine the struggle some people with colour blindness must have faced when they came across games of this type. Other issues I had with Super Wonder Boy was the controls. Now it jumps wonderfully, I won't lie about that. It was nice to play a light platforming game on the ZX Spectrum where you could control the jump midair. But Wonder Boy's movement while running is far from ideal. You see, for some reason to try and translate just how, well, let's call it slidey the game is on other systems. What happens on the ZX Spectrum is if you reach a running point and let go of the movement control well you'll just keep running and nothing stops that animation, you can't even slow it down. So rather than quickly trying to regain control of Wonder Boy as you would on most other systems, you had to consciously stop yourself from going into a running animation, which was incredibly frustrating. But I don't want to completely knock this game because it does have its plus points. Yes, they tried really hard with the background textures to make the game visually appealing, the jump controls wonderfully and the scrolling is fantastic for a spectrum. And to be fair, there was nothing quite like it on the system at the time. This is certainly one of the first action RPG games that I remember being on the ZX Spectrum. But when you have to balance the skills, the bad outweigh the good, unfortunately, with this game. So yes, at the point where I normally say, can I recommend this game? Only if you're a huge Wonder Boy fan and you want to experience every port that was out there. Or if you're like me, a die-hard Spectrum fan and you want to experience everything that that system had to offer as well. So no, I can't recommend you just rushing out and buying this game. You need to think long and hard about why you want it in your collection or why even you would like to play it. And that is Super Wonder Boy in Monsterland the wonderful Sega game published by Activision in 1987. The fourth game in the letter S is the wonderful Saboteur, brought to us by Jarell in 1986. And why Saboteur? Well, it's a ninja game, and back in the 80s, everyone loved ninjas. What am I talking about? Everybody still loves ninjas, they're just so cool. Now Saboteur was such a simple game. All you had to do was infiltrate the enemy base, kill as many guards as you could, and escape on the helicopter on the roof. 
Now I say simple, it did have various levels of difficulty that you could select. Levels 1 through 9 to be exact. But for the purposes of this video, I'll be playing through in level 1 because, well, it's been a while since I've played Saboteur and I don't think my old fingers are quite up to the stress levels of level 9. So as I said at the beginning, it's a simple premise. You're the Saboteur, you infiltrate the base and you kill the enemy guards. Now unfortunately it's not just the enemy guards that are going to get in your way, there are a couple of other enemies to watch out for. You have of course the guard dogs and the gun turrets. Now the gun turrets aren't too difficult to avoid. Quite fortunately they're not rapid fire machine guns or deadly lasers for that matter. They move quite slowly, track your position and shoot at you at a fairly sedate rate, especially on level 1. The guard dogs however are a completely different kettle of fish. They are a complete and utter nuisance who get in your way and there's just no way to kill them. Your only hope is to time your jump just right and get over them. Now for an early Spectrum game, 1986 is still fairly early in the ZX Spectrum's life cycle. The jumping mechanics aren't brilliant, they do suffice for the game but they are a bit on the clunky side. But there's more to games than just controls and let's look at the graphics. Now as I've said many times before, the monochromatic scheme was one that was adopted by most developers, especially early on. But they really do a good job of mixing it up in this game. The background screens change colour on a fairly frequent basis, which of course helps the game look a little bit more interesting. And like Super Wonder Boy, there's also complex textures employed in the backgrounds. But to get around the camouflage issues that Super Wonder Boy had, well your main character, your main sprite in this game of course is a ninja, and he is almost a completely black shadow, which works wonderfully against whatever background that he's running against. Now it's not a long game, and the longevity of this game is pure and been able to bump yourself up the levels and of course it's a high score game so it was a game that you would compete against your friends with. To be the saboteur with the highest amount of dollars, well that was as good as real currency on the playground back in 1986. So can I recommend you going out and playing Saboteur today in 2021? Well absolutely, because it's a fun little time killer of a game. It has a great high score system so you can compete against your friends and family so what more could you ask for in a game? And that is Saboteur from Jurel in 1986. For the last game in the letter S, we're going to look at Salamander from Konami in 1987. Now, if you don't come from the UK, you're probably looking at this gameplay and thinking, that's not Salamander, that's Life Force Well. Salamander was the name given to Life Force over here, so I'll forgive you straight away for getting confused. Now, as you can see from the gameplay, it's a vertical scroll and shoot 'em up, a shmup, call it what you want, but we called them shooters back in the day. And although I was never a big fan of shoot 'em ups, both Salamander and R Type of course were two games that were guaranteed to attract my attention if I spotted them in an arcade back in the mid 80s. And what it was about these games that really drew me in, well, it was the upgradable weapons. Anyone who knows me knows I'm an RPG guy, so if you put in front of me any style of game that has RPG elements, a way to upgrade your game character or ship in this case, well, I'm probably going to be attracted to that. Also, of course, I was a young teenager at the time, and the almost gruesome graphics of both our type and Salamander, well, they were quite fascinating to the younger crowd, let's say. And I, of course, was no exception to that rule. Now, I believe the premise of Salamander was that your ship was inside some kind of body, inside some sort of biological entity. Pretty much in the same vein as the film The Fantastic Voyage, where your ship is in fact the outside intruder, and it's the biology of the body that's trying to kill you from the inside. Again, another lovely gruesome touch that absolutely enthralled me and millions of other young teens back in the day. And of course, it was an arcade port, so it was as tough as nails. These games were not for the faint of heart, not graphically and certainly not gameplay either. But the gameplay is so smooth and so very addictive, you just get sucked into the moment. And come from Defender being my favourite shooter back in the day, this was such a huge leap forward. And without a doubt, this is a game that I would recommend anyone to play, even today. Yes, of course, there's better examples of the game, including the arcade cabinet itself, but the Spectrum does a fantastic job of this game. The graphics are fantastic for the system, the sound is basic, but just about every game in the Spectrum had basic sound, it was, it was just a fact of life. And the scrolling was probably just as good as you could get it on the Spectrum, so it was a fully 5 star game back in the day. 
So yes, 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 you have to pick up a copy of this game, even on the ZX Spectrum, and give it a go. It truly is one of the finest examples out there. And that is Salamander, or Life Force if you like, from Konami in 1987. So there you have it my friends, another selection of 8-bit masterpieces from the ZX Spectrum and yes, I do say that every time because well, to me each and every one of these games are 8-bit masterpieces. Now if you want to talk about any of these games, well, you just drop that down in the comments, let me know if you've played these games, let me know if you would like to play these games, or let me know if these games should be fired into the sun and forgotten for all eternity because your comments are what this channel thrives on. And of course, if you've enjoyed this video, well, hit me with a thumbs up on the way out because one, it's good for the channel, but two, you know, it makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. And of course, if you don't want to miss any future videos, well, the subscription button, it's always there, it's always free, and you can always change your mind. So thanks again for watching and until next time, as always, cheerio!